Hello and welcome to Big Ideas for Small Spaces. This series of webinars is being brought to you by Gardening the Hudson Valley and I'm your host, Marie Iannotti. I hope you've been enjoying the series so far and if you've missed any episodes, please you can access them on the website at www.gardeningthehudsonvalley.com. Today, we're visiting the Beatrix Farrand Garden Association in Hyde Park, where they're overseeing the preservation of the Beatrix Farrand Garden at Bellafield. And with me here are Executive Director Karen Smythe and Ann Sims, horticulturist and garden edu edu educator. <laughs> Um, welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. I am a huge fan of Beatrice Ferrand. Um, I think she's been very influential, but I don't think a lot of people know that much about her. Mm -hmm. So I hope we're going to go over some of uh, her work and her background today also. So um, yes, we we're thrilled to be able to share the garden. Um, we always think of this garden as a, a secret garden because <laughs> it's tucked away here in Hyde Park. Um, we're trying to get the word out about it. It's um, a beautiful garden designed by Beatrix Farron back in 1912 um, that was magnificent in its heyday but fell into disrepair and has been restored in the last 20 years by a nonprofit group, a citizens group that, that recognized it was an important garden and yeah. um, has saved it and restored it and it's open to the public. It's on the National Park property. Um, at the home of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt National Historic Site. So it's fully open to the public and free of charge. And so we hope people will come and visit. Well, that's always nice. It looks so inviting, but that's from the inside, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. That's from once you get through that garden gate. Yeah. Okay, so tell us something about Beatrix. Yes, um, uh, Beatrix Farrand was um, a, a very important garden designer, landscape designer. Um, spanning a long career of, uh, of over 50 years and 200 plus commissions. Um, she was a pioneering woman, but also a pioneering designer. Um, she was innovative in her design ideas and she was one of the first women to really tackle the full um, aspect of landscape design planting plans, knowing her horticulture intimately and very specific with her planting details, but also learning engineering and all the design principles and incorporating in that, in that into her work. She had massive commissions, huge gardens. Um, she was working in sort of in the Gilded Age where there are mm -hmm. lots of um, country properties that people wanted grand, wonderful gardens for. Um, was she from money? She she had a um, a very cultured family, um, but her um, her parents were divorced, which was kind of a scandal at that in that era. I think. And her mother um, was an amazing um, woman who actually worked as a literary agent and was um, created these salons in their brownstone in New York City. So Farron grew up um, as a young woman with. Um, uh, Henry James and Edith Wharton, who was actually her aunt, um, and they and she, so she had this very cultured upbringing, but I don't think they had the money that um, she was accustomed to, and that a lot of people people in her society um, had. And so I think for her, uh, launching a career was somewhat of a necessity, even though I think she also was passionate about what she did. And well, Wharton was Wharton wrote about gardens. Did she mm -hmm. influence? Uh, yeah. So. Farron, there was no way uh, for Farron to um, go to school for landscape architecture or to study this. Uh, so she really created her own course of study. And part of that was traveling. And they traveled in Europe. And her mother and Edith Wharton, um, I think there were a couple of trips in Europe that they um, were on together. And um, she did, you know, looked at gardens and wrote journal notes and, and really, really studied um, those classic iconic works in England and in Europe and also um, even in northern Africa she was fascinated mm. with the, um, the, the Islamic garden you know, d formal designs and, and gardens there so she really brought all that um, it, to bear on her own design and then when she got back from a lot from the traveling and uh, she also spent time with the Arnold Arboretum in um, and studied horticulture there, and she in Boston. In Boston, and she uh, 
took engineering classes at Columbia and she just cobbled together yeah. all the things that she needed to do this work. So she was resourceful. <laughs> she was indeed. Did she, did she start gardening as a child? Yes. So her um, family had a house in Maine and they went every summer and she loved the landscape and plants of the Maine coast. And it was in Mount Desert Island and she spent lots and lots of time out out on, um, on in, the, in the land, <clears throat> looking at plants, falling Do you in have love. Pictures of her? As a child? Um, no, I think there, there's, uh, there's one um, of her as a younger woman. Um, uh, this is, oh, this is at Smith. She was at the, um, she had um, an extensive um, plant collection. She always looks so serious. I know <laughs> she was. I think she was very serious. I think she, the, the anecdotal, you know, stories you know, say that she was very kind and lovely, but she she was stern. And uh, I think she intimidated a lot of the, the male crews that she probably had worked. to had, in order she, to get them she, to work. I think she had to. I think she, she had to be a strong um, force to get, to get through the world that she was in. Um, this is her at her library. She was very uh, great intellect and um, she had a, a huge, extensive collection of garden books. So she had a full-time career at a time when a lot of women didn't. She did. She worked. Um, it, it, there's this great story about when her husband, Max Farrand, um, took a job out in California. And so she had all these commissions on the East Coast, but was living with him on the West Coast and had a few commissions there. So she would take the train oh my <laughs> with her secretary and work the entire way. Wow. I think she was an, a, 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 an early workaholic. Did she provide the East Coast? <laughs> I think she did. I think she never really found um, her her world in the West Coast. She she did an, a few commissions, but I don't think she was appreciated in the way she might oh. should have been. And she, you know, grew up in the East. And it's a different palette of plants. Too. Exactly. And they did that both. Um, she and Max actually retired to the house in Maine, which is kind of wonderful to oh. think that they could get back there in later life. And this is just um, some images from, I would say, sort of her culminating work, um, Dunbarton Oaks in Washington, D.C., which is open to the public. Um, it's now owned by Harvard. And um, it, it was a garden that she worked on um, with the owners of this property for at least 20 years. So, so this she, is a private home? This is a private home. And this was a garden um, that was created on a very steep slope. And so you can see from this lower image, um, sort of looking down over this precipice, basically. And she created these wonderful series of garden rooms in which you can descend and then climb back up without really breaking a sweat. She just had this amazing way of, of timing the stairs and, mm. and thinking through your path so that when you got to the next area, you had time to rest and recover. And it, it's really quite, it's quite striking to me because it is on a very serious pitch. And so there was lots and lots of engineering required to make this work. She's kind of known for garden rooms though, isn't she? She is. And she uses these formal structures in such a magnificent way. Um, all these architectural pieces and um, water features and, you know, beautiful, beautiful architectural uh, structures. And yet she always incorporates a wild garden or um, a sort of naturalistic planting that is beyond the formal, that um, encloses the formal structure. So for example, at Dunbarn Oaks, there's a 32 acre wild garden that goes in, that wow. was designed in conjunction with this formal. That piece. has to be wild. <laughs> and it is now owned by the National Park Service and is under um, restoration from another nonprofit partner group. Um, so that's kind of exciting because it's, it has all these beautiful bridges and, and much more naturalistic features and many, many wonderful plantings of wildflowers flowers and spring bulbs that's and a huge undertaking yes yes so that's that's kind of exciting so this is her best known but let's talk about let's talk about Bellafield here mm -hmm. where you've been working on. so this is a, an image of the garden um, from the 1920s so this is after it was designed in 1912 but it sort of gives it, it's sort of the best thing we have in terms of the archival um, um, material to show the feeling of the garden um, there's definitely this loose, wonderful, um, blousy 
perennial borders um, on either side of very strong formal features. There's the wall um, that's up close. This is looking from the house, so it's down the long axis. axis. And then you see the stone wall turning into green wall. And so those blocky images down below are these extremely well um, pruned hedges that make these, these wonderful green walls. It's a large tree. Is that still here? That Unfortunately not. Oh. That tree was an elm tree, a, oh. a beautiful American elm that has died. And um, it was obviously here when Farron designed this garden. And it's kind of a crazy thing that she would leave it in this highly formal, highly symmetrical garden, completely off center, off to the side and, and creating shade. But I think it was kind of a wonderful um, play on the asymmetric asymmetric and the symmetric and I'm sure it was kind of a welcome shade in the summer and, and the warm temperatures. How did it shade? I imagine it must have shaded the, uh, the plants. <laughs> no, the patio is what I was thinking. The patio, the definitely. People. definitely. <laughs> but yes, the plants too. Well, and it's interesting because you see there are a lot of trees around and, and yet, you know, she's tackling all these perennials that are generally sun lovers. Yeah. So. <laughs> And that's looking is. back at the house and um, this beautiful um, elm tree. And this was actually in 1929, so it sort of shows you the garden, you know, continuing on. Looks like there's a squirrel's nest up there. <laughs> it does. <laughs> they must be very disappointed. <laughs> and this is just a shot to show that you can, it was very hard to try to identify the plants from the photographs that we had, but this shows um, very clearly a peony in the foreground and lots of these spiky plants um, that, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure there are other, there are probably irises and it always looks like there are lots of foxgloves. Um, those are the few that we can really tackle. Were you here at the beginning of the restoration? I, I was um, hired um, after the, the citizens group formed and was facing the, the replanting of these perennial borders. And so they brought me in to kind of tackle that. And I've been here ever since. It'll be my 17th season wow. here. <laughs> Good for you. So do you know how to take a garden from nothing to uh, back to its glory um, days? Well, we'll, we'll have, we should show an image of the, of the garden when, uh, oh, this is another, just a beautiful image of the, the babies that you just get the feeling this really was a family garden and that the children were here. Um, that they really lived in the space. And, and so there's, there's another um, image again of the children. They had their chickens, they played with their chickens out and then <laughs> they had snowball fights and there's, there's a beautiful- this is just their backyard. This I is guess. their backyard, yeah. Now yeah, there, there we is, have yeah. the baby in the foxgloves, pretty <laughs> heavenly. But this is what this group tackled um, in the early 1990s and um, we had, there was a, a person, a resident of Hyde Park who spent time on the national park sites, but she tucked her head in here one day and said, this is an important garden, even though it was in such horrible shape and did some research and discovered that it was a Farron garden. And her daughter was actually um, getting her landscape architecture degree at Cornell at the time and was just fascinated by it and actually did extensive research as part of her, as her thesis and went to Berkeley where Farron's archive is housed and found the original plans. Oh my goodness. And really? um, so we were able to take those plans and um, work toward recreating this garden and in its fullest. And there were there was a lot to do at the very beginning. As you can see, the National Park Service, there's a big hunk of black plastic showing there. The National Park Service had laid plastic down in order to just try to keep it at bay, so keep the no weeds plants? at bay. There were no plants. And, um, and just to add a little perspective of history, the um, Newbold family had donated the property, including the garden, to the National Park Service in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So the garden itself yes. probably wasn't in great shape at that point, and the National Park Service had had the property for about 20 years before the volunteers started to... Mm -hmm. Without any resources yeah. to maintain it. Yeah. Now the wall itself was still in good shape? The wall itself was intact. Um, there has had to be some repointing done on it, but it just has held up magnificently. 
and um, the original gate, the ironwork for the gates, the gates had rotted, but the ironwork was here and in shape we've been able to use. Yes. And the other thing that's quite permanent is the stone edging. And you can see maybe in some of the other pictures, but there's you know, the stone edging that runs along to define the perennial borders, and that is not going anywhere. The, the, um, the stones are on end, sometimes two feet deep, these oh massive goodness. flat stones. So it comes up as a kind of a low edging, but it's not moving. <laughs> That's wonderful. And we should mention that the Newbolds were the family that lived here and commissioned this uh, garden, and they were a prominent family, but evidently not historic enough to warrant uh, funding. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> well, and, and I think just in the shadow of, of Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt, Roosevelt, the next door neighbor, and so when the, when the National Park was in need of service buildings and a building to house its offices, um, the, the, when the building was donated by the Newbold family, that was the designation as a service uh, structure, not so much as a historic piece. So it's not open to the public, that beautiful house here. So they, did their descendants not appreciate how important the garden was? I think they may have. I think it might have just been um, a challenge of resources to try to maintain yeah. something like this. And Even as we all know, <laughs> to, to, yeah. this is 3,000 square feet of perennial borders. So that's it's kind of a lot. Well, to even, even the well funded historic sites don't have any funding for the garden. For the that's garden. For the house. Yeah. Well, and this was a house that was their spring and fall house, similar to the Vanderbilt mansion. So they had other houses in the family. But yeah. They also had, they to had a lot to tackle. <laughs> it's tough being wealthy, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take another look at yeah, there's oh, there's that. Yeah, that shows plastic. you the black plastic. So that, but that's a, a nice shot of that beautiful edging, and all these, um, all the structures are made from native stone, and you get the feeling that Farron would was very keen on using materials from the place that she was working, and and so you see the native stone, and you see the. Um, the let the sort of leaving some of the native trees around these massive locusts that were here. She was fascinated with native plants, which we'll see later in the mm -hmm. in the garden bed. So this is what you inherited, uh, mm -hmm. kind of an empty space. And when you found the original plants in up in Maine, did they have any idea of? Uh, did she list out the plants she wanted? Well, to this was the interesting piece that there were um, wonderful plant plans, which we'll see later, of the architectural features and this beautiful um, overall layouts. There were no specific planting plans in the archive, and we searched high and low, and in the attic of all of the Newbold family, and no one could come up with a with a planting plan. It is heartbreaking. So, what we ended up doing was, and Kate Karen sort of engineered this idea when she was writing her thesis, but she took plans of a nearby garden, in actually in Harrison, so it was farther south, but it was very similar layout. And she was able to just take those planting plans and kind of superimpose them onto this garden. And was we were able to use this fabulous plant list, very extensive plant mm -hmm. list, and um, get a feeling that it was something that she might have done in this garden, given that it was designed very similar time period. So that's, oh, been, lucky, that's yeah. been a great resource. And this is one of the pictures from from the from the nineties when um, you see the hedge had overgrown its bounds completely. No one had been pruning, and then except for the deer who'd been underneath uh, eating and browsing and sort of turning the uh, hemlocks into lollipops. Kind of ruins the formal nature of the <laughs> yes. garden, doesn't it? You lose that green wall, but at least the grass is back. Mm -hmm. The grass is there. And here we, you'll just see what ultimately had to happen, which is the hedge had to come down completely. And um, there's, I think the next shot shows us the, yeah, that, that's the, the, the trees uh, coming out and then the new hemlocks uh, waiting to be installed. Wow. And the National Park Service was wonderfully supportive of, of, of this project and some of these big planting projects, including the, the lawn. Um, while our nonprofit has had to raise all the money for the other restoration and certainly the, the uh, perennial borders and, and the maintenance. And here we have a um, hundred years down the line, we celebrated the centennial in, in 2012. Um, and I, I always say it's not fully restored because it's an ongoing process, always changing, dynamic, but um, gives you a feeling that we've, we've got it. We've got it back. But it's looking better. So these are your peonies that you're talking about. Yeah, there, there were many, many peonies um, in the plans that sh that were used. And also, one of the miraculous things that happened was when the black plastic was pulled back in that next season, 
some peonies came up out of the ground after being submerged in the black plastic. So that shows you, we, we, we felt it a sign, a kind of phoenix rising from the ashes. <laughs> so, it, it, and these are obviously 100 year old plants. These peonies last forever. And yeah. so that's, I mean, there's so many reasons why they're a wonderful garden plant, but um, the durability and also the fact that the deer don't like them is, is another wonderful thing about them. So did they, the ones that came out on their own, did they fit into the plan that you had? We moved them around, okay. but yeah, we, we were able to use them. So do you have a lot of deer problems here? Yeah, the, the garden would not be possible if it weren't for a deer fence and this really tall, tight, uh, tall wall. We have a woodchuck problem too. <laughs> yes, I know, once you get the fence up, the woodchuck. The woodchuck comes <laughs> right up underneath the stone wall. It doesn't even mess around. Yeah. And this just gives you a feeling for how um, sort of complex these perennial borders are. There are many, many plants used um, as for texture and lots of spikes, um, spiky plants like this um, um, foxgloves. And um, there are beautiful combinations of plants. One of my favorites is the yucca that she uses. And this sh there's a little image of this yucca frond coming up, which I always love more than the actual blossom of it. But um, there's a lot of volume and height in her. Interesting her that she used yuccas because they're not, you know, they're not exactly exalted. And you certainly don't today. think of them as, as perennial garden no. plants. But the wonderful thing about them is they're native plants to the Northeast. How do you really? You think and of you, them as southwestern You think plants. they must be, but they, they're actually um, native all the way up and down the East Coast. Um, and again, like just to such a fabulous texture. Do you know if they attract any kind of uh, particular insects or? Well, there, I know that when, when ours are in bloom, there are many pollinators buzzing, you know, we That's get lots of these and, and, um, and butterflies. Tell us something about the colors that she did. Yeah, um, it's, it's such a beautiful um, image for planting and it feels sort of old fashioned, um, but she uses these monochromatic color palettes in various sections in the garden. So um, there are four, color palettes that we're using in the plans that we've adopted. One is um, purple and mauve, and then that moves down into the cream blush and gray, which is the border that we're looking at right now. Um, and in that cream and I mean, in the um, gray, you're obviously gonna get a lot of foliage um, uh, plants to, to create that effect. And then on the other side, you start with um, pink and crimson and that um, border moves into a pure white border that runs all the way down. That's not it. Yeah. I wanted to ask, and let's go back to the last one here. Mm -hmm. um, this, so this is a double border. You can walk between them. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a it's very smart. It's very helpful for maintenance as well because mm. it puts it makes the borders seem larger uh, and wider, but you can get in between, and you don't have as much you know tromping across the borders, which which we're never supposed to do. Um, so that you'll find. The paths on the inside of the structure are a bit wider, and so those outer paths that go in between the double borders are what I consider kind of a secondary path, a little bit more narrow, and they can almost get lost um, when you're looking back across the border. It almost appears as it's a mm. single border, and it's, and it's certainly the same palette um, from inner to outer. When you were experimenting with the, what, what plants to use, did you have any that just didn't cut it? Many, 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 many plants that did not cut it. And I can't even begin to tell you the disasters and the, and the failures um, because first of all, we were using these planting plans that I think were meant for more sun than what we have here. Certainly plants that don't do well with root competition and we have these massive trees surrounding the garden. So lots and lots of root competition. Um, and you just never know. In, in any particular place, things will either thrive or not thrive, just maybe little minute um, conditions that aren't met. So we've kind of wiggled our way through this massive plant list with you know, hundreds of species of plants to um, a group that is working. Okay. <laughs> and we have lots, we have lots of plants that are, um, sp that are spreaders. And so we're constantly hacking away and fighting them back and letting the other ones survive. So it's, it's, it's a negotiation at all times. <laughs> but the, the peonies seem to be like the queen of the garden here. And I think yes. you, you do your um, annual, uh, 
event. Yes, yeah, exactly. we, ha we have a wonderful um, event. This will be our ninth annual Belfield Design Lecture. We we have tried to time it in June when those peonies are at their peak. And of course, it's always a little bit earlier, a little bit late, but um, who knows what this year will be? <laughs> we, I know. I can't even imagine having anything bloom by June, but I hope it will. <laughs> So yeah, that's, it's, it's a great moment to see the garden. It, it really is. is. Oh, gosh. And this is just a beautiful image of um, a close-up of some of her iron work and the designs that um, she created. Again, very specific, um, but beautiful detailing. So she designed even the iron work. Yeah. And the gates. And so you see this in this next image, you'll see that her design for this piece. Um, it's got a few variations in its final form if you kind of compare them, but it's 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 the basic idea and it's just stunning. Um, there's underneath this gate is also this other ironwork that has this arts and crafts feeling with um, sort of big heavy um, L hinges with a hand hammered effect. You know that's it's it's really quite beautiful. Surprised she didn't do her own ironwork. Yeah, and she might have. <laughs> so this is a beautiful um, image of the layout of the garden, and it gives you um, a way to see and understand. I think the overarching design idea for this garden, which is a use of force perspective, and you see these sort of telescoping uh, garden rooms laid out. Um, so and the house is, is on the left? Yes, the now. house is on the left, so you'd be looking out from the terrace, uh, and then the darker line is the stone wall, and then the lighter li out, outer lines are uh, indicating a hedge. So you get this feeling um, of this long, long, long axis, and the idea, I think, was to have it appear longer than it was. Um, the Roosevelt's um, lane uh, and um, came right at the end of the garden and their property stopped the stopped the effect. So I think she was trying to create a sense that it was larger and grander than than it was than it could be. Yeah, and it, I was it would be a good idea for any homeowner who has a, a long, thin, you know, uniform rectangular lot to be able to do something like this in their backyard and make it seem mm -hmm. like they have a lot more space to work with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also the the idea of an axis is one of those kind of universal forms that draws people toward it. I think people, when you see a, a, a straight, long axis, first of all, your eye is drawn to what is there at the end of it. And second of all, I think you're drawn to move through it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was just this very simple but uh, basic idea she was working with. And of course, we're seeing it without all the color and all the plants. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other reasons, you. yeah other reasons to get out in it so. and the outside the uh, lines outside. yeah that this is indicating the the wild garden that she designed to surround the garden and i think to as an effect of clothing and making it feel um see it uh, enclosed even harder to find <laughs> even harder to find yes i no, think, I think you were supposed to be as private as you could be once you were in here are you going to try and uh, recreate that at yeah, so the, the, we don't, have, again, we don't have any specific planting plans for the, for what was intended for the wild garden. And so we we're basically using information from um, some of the old photographs and even some aerial photographs that we were able to find um, through the National Park Service archive and looking at other plans in which she used wild gardens. So you see this over and over and over in her work as sort of a combination of a very uh, highly structured formal piece and then either surrounding or, or entering into this informal wild garden and, and sort of sculpting nature. You know, mm. you, you get the feeling that it's it's very much um, created, but but trying to feel naturalistic and to get you back into the natural we're world. Oh, we're just seeing that one come to fruition. Yeah, so that's gonna that's a next the next big project on our plate. Excellent. Oof. Yeah, so here we have a, a this aerial view, this bird's eye view that gives you a, a sense of um, the structure, the telescoping effect, and that force perspective. And then you can see this is this moment where you see this great um, progression from the architectural forms of the stone wall, um, but also clothed in green, so bringing in this element of nature. And then the stone wall becomes a green wall that's, that is clipped to um, mirror it exactly. And then the green wall moves into um, just finally a green room of lawn and and hedge and then out through the gate which was not a gate originally it was actually just a cut 
uh, an archway uh, trimmed into the hedge is is the wild garden and beyond is the idea is that you're moving right into nature into the trees hmm. i see you replaced the tree yes yeah. <laughs> there's our tiny little elm and <laughs> it's another elm we decided not to use an american elm for for yeah. obvious reasons of this this tragedy of the American Dutch elm disease, uh, which is still affecting trees. And sometimes they'll grow and be great and healthy, and then 50 years later, they'll die. So mm. we just didn't want to take the risk. And uh, we've actually planted a Chinese elm oh, okay. and did the research to find that she used uh, the Chinese elm in at Dunbarton Oak. So I feel like it's something she might have, she might have put. <laughs> She would if she was living now. She would, <laughs> yeah. And this is just um, you know, a ch chance for us to see the, the layout. This shows those inner and outer pathways in the double borders on the outside. And um, also just that wonderful design across the top, which shows her designing the walls and the wonderful archway in through the gates. And then even the pintle of the, the on which the gate hangs, you know, all very specific and architectural. How oh, great that these all are still around that you could find them. Yeah, so it's, it's so wonderful to be able to have these. If only she'd kept plant lists. You know? Oh, I know, <laughs> I know, it just breaks your heart. And this just gives you a feeling of those borders. Um, again, we're looking from those um, outer pathways across, and you don't even realize exactly that they're going to be those inner paths. Mm -hmm. Did she use gravel? Yes, yeah, so these paths were originally gravel um, and, and again the stone edging is held up and is so beautiful and, the, and that way of kind of delineating the um, ge sort of geometrical and then things spilling over and it's this great tension between that you know loose and, and flowing and then the, the strong uh, geometric shape. How are the stone paths to maintain? A lot of weeding. Yeah, a lot of weeding. But we do. We once we get it. Once we get it sort of tackled, we've kept the weed seeds pretty under control. Yeah. We, we do okay. It looks so nice, but they can get. They can just get their little roots in there. Well, and I am a big believer that that path is as important as anything else in the garden because if it's not clear and clean then your eye gets all mm -hmm. fuzzy and I feel like the edges of things are so important in terms of really completing the design even on a subconscious level so we do a lot of raking of the paths because yeah. it's it's um it's a zen meditation but it's also <laughs> okay. really important to the effect okay. yeah <laughs> And there you go, just sort of looking back from the cream blush and gray, looking back into the white border, that pure white. Very con contemplative and quiet um, color palette. I think it, it promotes this feeling of sort of peace and quiet and ease. Now, the white garden towards the rear, that's the second room mm -hmm. from the house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. More of the cream blush and gray, looking back again at texture and plume poppy, which is just a crazy plant to try to tackle in a sm small space, but we somehow do. It was on the planting plan, so we're de dedicated to making it happen. <laughs> it's a good plan. It's just a, a, a little bit of maintenance It's involved. a vigorous, it's a yes, vigorous it plant. But it, it grows so quickly, and it's nice the way it covers the... Uh, it's wonderful the height, too. Yeah, really love. And okay. the white border looking up into the pink border, and you'll see the, the wall and its exuberant uh, vine growth. So we have to keep hacking away at the vines, uh, keep that under control. So I see you have hosta in there too. Mm -hmm. so yeah, she had several fine. different hosta. Funkia, as she called it, that was the name back in the day, the Funkia species name. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's one of the things we've had to do is decipher, you know, do the research to figure out some of the old Latin names that have changed sometimes two and three wow. times <laughs> since she wrote them. <laughs> I guess I would not have known what Funkia was. <laughs> right. Ah, so this is a different this season, gives you same the, color scheme. This gives you the April view, yeah, down the white border. And you see um, all these wonderful bulbs. We use some of the old um, daffodils, uh, two that are so beautiful, one the pheasant eye, Narcissus, and another one called Thalia, which is quite early. It's found in late 19th century gardens, but very fragrant, too, which is just a delight. Can, you can Pure find white. it today still? That one is quite 
um, available on usually online. Um, we found ours at um, Brent and Becky's bulbs, mm. but I've seen it. it. It's more common than you know you would think. It's called Thalia. Thalia, T H A L I A, and then okay. the Fezzani is, is is pretty common with a little tiny orange center. How about the tulips? Do you have to replace them? Yeah, that, we've had to replace them, and we we've had we were lucky in a couple of the borders. I ended up choosing more modern tulips that that are better at keeping going. Uh, the white ones seem to always peter out, so we just have to keep keep adding, but it's worth it. <laughs> I guess the deer fence is working. Yes, thank goodness for that. Yeah, and this is just a, a chance to go back and look at that um, wild garden image around the outside and um, sort of wonderful squiggly line. And what we're really hoping is to use that wild garden space not only to clothe and um, enclose the garden, but to create um, an, uh, an organic approach from the now um, visitor center, which is here on the property. And we're hoping just to be able to help people find their way to our secret garden in a, in a little bit clearer pathway. This just shows you some of the shrubs that were outside the garden. Um, the this is the mock orange again very fragrant and um, you get the feeling that there was there were many trees but also these kind of dense large shrubs as well in that this complements the house the colors yeah that's good and this is um, looking down the garden just in with an eye to the wild garden that was outside this is one of the original trees to the garden uh, that I'm sure she left in place because I think it's older than the garden, but it's a Halesia or silver bell. It shows it just coming into bloom, but it's really a stunning thing. And um, it's a beautiful, what I always think of as kind of a understory tree, a small um, flowering tree, but like a dogwood. But it, this is, it shows you what can happen if it fully matures. Mm. <laughs> beautiful. And then the magnolias, there are many magnolias outside of the garden as well, which I think Baron had a, a hand in um, planting and, and creating. And then you see the uh, wall, and this is kind of a, a, a nice moment to see the, the wisteria, the vines on the wall before they become green, and also to take a look at the trellising which is a kind of simple structure, which is something that people might be able to use at home. I think there's a, the next um, slide's gonna show us the, the, this is her design for this structure, which is upright uh, pieces of locust that basically are like two by fours. And then those are bolted to the wall. And then there are just pieces of bamboo that run horizontally through uh, just simple staples that you buy at the, at the hardware store. And so what we do is um, we've been able to use the original locust piece that pieces that were with great foresight, the National Park Service took them all down when they first um, acquired the property and, and put them in the basement for safekeeping and numbered them so that when the, and I was not here quite yet, but the original uh, group restoring the garden put them all back up and then we've just replaced the bamboo, which is easy to come by, just as staking, you know, we get this tall staking bamboo and use it. And so it's a very simple structure and she actually used it several times. I see it repeated in her designs throughout her, her career. And it's strong enough to hold a wisteria. Exactly. It's pretty, pretty amazing that way. There, there we see it with the wisteria. And it's great to see the, the wall through that too. I, I kind of love that, that we can see that form. Again, it's the formal structure juxtaposed to that um, informal and um, full vegetation. Although you could use that anywhere. You could use that to hide your garage if you exactly. wanted to. Exactly. You can certainly use it on a house. In fact, Farron was very um, interested in vertical spaces. And you'll see at her work at Princeton where she did, she was, um, the consulting landscape architect, architect um, there for many, many years, she was intent on clothing the walls of the building with vines and wisteria and, um, and the ivies, and, and she was keen about that. You'll see that there are pictures from her house in Maine where they just had every surface of the outside of the house covered yeah. in vines. <laughs> A lot of maintenance, but so beautiful. Yeah, it is. And this just looking back at the house and um, some of those amazing peonies. The terrace is 
The terrace is that wonderful um, inside outside transition and, and these beautiful French doors that open. And as we've seen, peony, 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 but I, I thought it'd be fun to sort of look at some of the plant combinations that she used with peonies, because a lot of times people will have peonies in their gardens and say, well, they're great in June, and then it rains and it's all over. So then what do you do with all this sort of dull foliage for the rest of the season? So, so Farron had a wonderful idea. She interplanted these with lilies and um, well, a number of different bulbs. So here you have um, just good old fashioned Easter lilies, which we don't normally think of. You know, we have them in, in Easter, but they actually bloom naturally here in July. So after the peonies are all done, up come these wonderful lilies and you get a whole nother round of blossom in that same area in the garden. That's smart. So you don't have to re constantly plant the lilies. They, they the lilies survive. come back. We've, I mean, some more than others. I've, and I found that the, there's some that are quite strong and recurring and then others, um, there's this beautiful one called Lilium auratum, uh, the, the sunburst lily. And I, love it and I can't keep it going. So I just sort of keep trying to keep planting a few just to keep them there. But um, this is a plant called summer hyacinth or Galtonia candicans is the Latin name. And it's another really quite handsome, tall summer bulb that will grow up to um, three to four feet. And it can, it comes emerging out of these peony foliages as well. Oh, and, and it's an unusual plant. You don't see it very often, but I find it it's just fascinating and wonderful. I love that idea of planting it underneath it. And, yeah, and here's another lily that comes up in the uh, cream, blush, and gray border, and then you see the outsides of those petals with this beautiful blush color. And it's a, um, Lilium brownii, which is a very rare plant that I searched and searched high and low and finally found it, of all things, in a nursery in Texas called the Yuckadoo Nursery. And so they <laughs> sent it up here. And um, he wasn't even, he just said, I'm not sure this is hardy. And so we've had it now for about uh, seven years and it's slowly increasing little tiny little lily bulbs on the outside. So I'm hoping that it'll one day be able to have more, but it's, um, it's stunning. It's quite tall. How do you source uh, plants for the garden? Well, when I first started, I there was no internet. There was just no, it was literally nothing on the internet. And a lot of the, none of the nurseries had their catalogs up. So there was no search, no searching. Um, and so I had some wonderful associations with people that were interested in historic plants. Um, there is this fabulous organization called the Historic Iris Preservation Society, which helped us source a lot of the name varieties of, of um, iris that were in the garden that were just not in catalogs. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's been really fun, almost like a treasure hunt to find the plants. And nowadays it's, it's much easier with the good old Google. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a shame because so many, I mean, a, a lot of the historical plants are still very hardy and very uh, garden worthy, and but fragrant, yeah, and fragrant, yeah. but they're being supplanted because people want to sell what's new and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, exciting. It, it and becomes so it. trendy, <laughs> yes. doesn't it? it, it I, I find that every year there's a whole new thing that we've got to have. This is another wonderful plant called Hesperus matronalis, which is um, just a side of the road weed a lot of people think of, but it's an wild early, flower. early wild. wildflower. <laughs> it's not native, so we can't we um, can't say it's one of our natives, but it it is such a great garden plant and something you don't see very often in perennial gardens, but it's like a phlox, as you can see, and it's lots of volume and lots of effect from a long distance, but it's before the peonies have even bloomed. Yeah. It's quite early. So this is truly layered, so you don't have mm. a great deal of space, but you just continually have several plants some. in one spot. She'll have literally like sometimes three species of plants in the same wow. little circle. Now, does that cut down on weeding? <laughs> sort of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do pretty well with weeding. We do mulch, which I don't think was the trend in those days, and we try to use a very fine uh, grade of mulch, but that helps us a lot with the weeds. But you must have a lot of self-sowers. 
Yes, lots okay. and lots. Yeah, which so is why you have a plant stand. <laughs> volunteers, right? We have here's an example of a beautiful volunteer. So underneath that pink iris is this wonderful plant um, called Ragged Robin, and it's an old-fashioned little short-lived perennial. So, but it also seeds itself in like mad, and so I don't mind it one bit. I just never can get enough of it, and if not, I just dig it up and put it in other places or put it in the plant mm. sale. We have lots of people that have so nice with all those uh, sure with the iris leaves yeah, all completely interplanted you know this this idea that you know these things just intermingle it's just so wonderful so you won't even notice what's a weed and what's not a weed right. <laughs> all yeah. of this That's and this is one. a beautiful iris um, which is called black prince and which we have never been able to find in the trade but we're able to find um, at the Historic Plant Center at Monticello, and they had just a few, sent us a couple of rhizomes, we got it going, and then heard back from them a year ago that they had lost all of theirs and that needed, and that did we have it still? And I said, oh yes, we do. Thank goodness. <laughs> could send it straight back. So it's, it's one of those great lessons in gardening that the more you share, the better off you are. You so never can lose your plants. That's nice. And these, this is another great plant, um, the an Japanese anemone. This is anemone, um, it's a hybrid honorine Jobert. And it is just the most beautiful, wonderful, long blooming plant in September and October, and all the way up till frost. We when have you it need till it, November. Yeah. yeah, when you really need it. And so bright and um, grows quite well in the shade. And so you get this amazing bright white uh, in, in some sort of dark shade, shady areas. Do you need a lot, do they need a lot of moisture? They need moisture, but they are so tough and hardy that it's almost like you can't kill them. The only thing that will kill them is cold, cold temperatures. So this last winter we had, I'd say we lost about a third of our uh, white mm -hmm. anemones, but they are so vigorous and they grow out um, in, um, you know, underneath the ground and reproduce that way. So you, you really, you have a lot. I mean, they really are very vigorous growers. So yeah, I didn't realize they were um, hardy in our area. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I know you have the stone wall that gives some heat back, but I'm thinking of trying them on like a south-facing border. Yeah, and I think do. the other th um, thing that makes this garden have such a nice uh, microclimate is the stone walls, uh, reflective of heat, but also wind block. So, uh, so many times it's the wind that can get plants, and especially if we don't have enough of a snow cover. Um, so that that's really helped us have some things over winter that normally don't. These are great. Yeah, that's beautiful. And so uh, this is my image of the kind of gardening crew that Farron would have wanted for this <laughs> garden. This is actually um, for um, a, gar a, a garden that no longer exists in, in southern England. But I just love this picture because I, I feel like that's what we really need. And <laughs> yeah, doesn't everybody? <laughs> doesn't everybody? <laughs> with with 3,000 square feet of perennial borders. But instead, we have this group of vo wonderful volunteers. And they come every Tuesday morning. Um, we do uh, so much. We accomplish so much work in a couple hours and have such a fun time. And everyone shares their own gardening woes and brings plants that are diseased and we all help <laughs> each other figure out what to do and um, we also offer um, four times a year we have a garden a hands-on gardening workshop which all the volunteers end up uh, participating in and we tackle different tasks like how to divide perennials or how to pinch back perennials to um, prolong bloom or you know sort of um, real specific tasks in the perennial garden because a lot of times you get kind of a general overview of perennial garden gardening but there's so many mm -hmm. techniques that can really be helpful so that's that's a fun thing can you use more volunteers we could always use more volunteers so people are welcome to come we, we meet Tuesday morning starting in April and work usually through October and um, it's we always arrive around nine o'clock. It's very informal and fun, and so we love we love to welcome people. Should they bring their own tools? Yeah, just mostly your own pruners and your own gloves. But we have some in the shed, and we can you know people forget we can pass them around. And we have lots of tools. Other than that, we have lots of uh, shovels and spades. You can always weed rakes exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Lots of weeding. Oops. Ooh, yeah, we just, we just see us cutting back. There's just so much vegetation that has to be cut yeah. back throughout the season. Um, and we do have a, a wonderful compost heap that the National Park Service helps us with it. They take our um, 
cuttings and then and, and add it to their huge pile, which is quite big and, and they have big machinery to turn it and it's hot and, and kind of wonderful because I think that really kills the weed seeds. Mm. That's nice so we're lucky. Yeah. yeah. Is that salvia? Uh, yeah, that's salvia? actually um, the salvia indigo, indigo spires, that purple, yeah. And we have, this is a grandchild of one of our volunteers, but we, we encourage all ages and really <laughs> love, them young. love have children, ha, love to have children in the garden. There's so many wonderful plants and textures and things and, and fragrances that they just delight in. She looks happy. She's got her little gloves on. She's a hat. great little worker, this one. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have a, a program for teenagers and it's been so successful it's this will be our fourth year um, of hosting these teens who are in a program called green teen and they're learning um, horticulture but mostly in productive gardening and vegetable gardening but as part of their program we invited them to come to Belfield to um, think about de uh, design and landscape um, architecture and horticulture as a career um, and really get to teach them some of the wonderful design principles that Farron used here. And we asked them to design their own gardens, which is yeah. just an amazing, I, I cannot tell you the beautiful gardens they've come up with over the years and very elaborate, always elaborate, elaborate and, and ornamental, despite despite the fact that they usually have fruit trees and vegetables growing in them as well. That's nice, they're, they're from the local schools. So they come actually up from Beacon, but it's part of a, um, a project out of Cornell Cooperative Extension. And so they, they have this, it's really kind of a, a very um, extensive program that has changed lives for some of these kids. It's really been fantastic. Have any of them gone into horticulture? <laughs> well, one of our um, boys who was with us for two years because he loved it so much, he has um, is, is starting to study architecture. He's decided Ooh. that he wants to be an architect. And he's, you know, he, he never dreamed of that before his, this program. <laughs> so this is exciting. That's great. So here, yep, they're designing. Yeah, here we have That's pretty good, this. actually. It's really quite beautiful what they have done. Wow, talent there. Mm -hmm. and, and we also do these studies in horticulture and really look carefully at plants. And um, this is a group of kids that are sort of self-identified plant lovers. So I can't tell you how much fun it is to work with, with um, you know, kids that are coming already passionate about it. And that's, we really have, have had just a fantastic time. That's excellent work though, look at that, Beautiful. look at the detail. Beautiful, yeah. And they also just spend time, we, we always talk about the emotional aspect of a garden and, and certainly that in, as a designer who's really thinking about people's emotions as they're moving through the space. And so we have them journal. And so they've just had this amazing journal entries that they've been able to share about how the garden makes them feel and the feeling of relaxation and the feeling of their blood pressure dropping. And um, it's, it, it's been the most inspiring thing for us because we realize that um, this garden is relevant today and that it's not just, you know, a garden that worked 100 years ago, but that somehow it's magical and it's transformative for these kids who've not really been in a lot of gardens mm -hmm. like this. Which is interesting because you know, even kids who have gardens at home, I don't think they really notice them if, to come mm -hmm. and have someone point it out to them is, is mm -hmm. almost necessary these days. Get look away from the screen and look. Exactly, <laughs> that's a real thing, exactly. Yeah. Um, so they come more than once during They the come season? three times. We have them um, in April, May, and June, right as the garden is oh, having nice. its great transition from from the ground, from the bare earth to the full vegetation. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful, lucky kids. And we, um, this is part of our annual uh, design lecture, which we spoke about earlier. We always have a speaker, many times, um, you know, looking at various aspects of design. Um, we've had experts on Farrand in the past, which has been helping us all understand at a greater depth about her impact as a designer and her specific design ideas. Um, but also, um, this year we have Lyndon Miller, who is uh, a very important designer of urban gardens and public gardens in particular. Didn't she do just about everything in New York everything City. Everything in New York City. <laughs> All the beautiful, delicious uh, perennial gardens. The Conservatory Garden uh, in Central Park and Bryant Park was originally her design. Yeah. Um, down at uh, Battery Park City, she designed a very uh, intense ornamental perennial garden as part of that beautiful landscape. 
Um, she has done extensive designs at Columbia University and also at Princeton where Farron was. And so she is actually coming to talk to us about her um, um, experience with, with Farron's work over the years and how it's influenced hers and how it's inspired her. Certainly Farron is a woman um, pioneer and as a role model in that way, but also from um, the design perspective and Farron's extensive thinking about public spaces because oh. she designed all of these public spaces for the universities at Princeton and Yale and um, she she was had a very keen mind about what was important in those spaces and so Farron um, has greatly influenced Lyndon's work and so we're so excited to get to hear about you know about good. that perspective. Has she been here before? She has. She came a couple of years ago uh, when we had Rick Dark who um, is was talking about the wild garden um, for us and she um, just fell in love with it and she's just um, been real she spent a lot of time at Dunbar Notes in the last two years really looking at Farron's work there and um, and the sort of maintenance pr principles principles that Farron was establishing there because it's such an important part of of gardens going forward, and certainly public gardens that public, have to be yes. maintained at such a level. So it's we're really excited about this topic. So that's the first. That's going to be Sunday in June. Yeah, that's the first Sunday in June, June seventh, and the lecture is at two at the Wallace Visitor Center, which is right here at the garden. And then we all walk over and have a beautiful reception and a plant sale. You'll see on this slide the, the plants for sale. Lots of the of the babies from the garden. And, it's a um, big baby. And there, yes, we have some some pretty wonderful plants and some of these unusual varieties uh, that it's hard, they're sort of hard to come by in nurseries. So this is a fun, a fun thing for us to be able to share and get these plants out there. And this is our lovely reception that we have, and this is in the in the house in the Morgan room um, that is not really open to the public. So this is the one great moment that you get to see. Um, see the house and experience the garden from inside. This is the room that overlooks the garden? Yes, yes. Okay. So right outside those French doors is the garden. Very nice. And, and lots of flower arrangements. <laughs> so the flower arrangements that we just saw, these are the, they are they're all, made by the volunteers? We, we, um, everyone cuts flowers from their own gardens and we make these massive amounts of flower arrangements. And then of course we have them for sale as part of the plant sale. Oh, so really? people can take them home. This is oh. These are some of our happy our happy uh, party goers with their souvenirs, nice souvenirs, and then and the plant sale. You can get some big plants at the plant sale and take home the the Beatrix Farron garden and some of Farron's sort of signature plants. It's great. Okay, well, thank you both so much for letting me come down here and showing me your garden. Um, I thank everybody who's been watching. Remember, if you missed any episodes, be sure to check them out on the website at www.gardeningthehudsonvalley.com. And I hope you're picking up some great ideas for your own garden. Um, if you have any questions, you can always find the Beaches Farron Garden Association online. Certainly stop by and visit their garden at any time. As they said, it's free to come and look at the garden anytime. Well, you know, when it's growing <laughs> from April to October <laughs> to come in February. But, well, you uh, can. There just won't be any <laughs> Just we, have, we won't be able to get the gates the, open. The but. wall <laughs> looks beautiful. <laughs> there you go. If you want to see the, the bones of the garden, do, do come in February. So, um, Karen and Ann, thank you both so much. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for letting me come today. It's wonderful. Thank you. Loved having you.